Welcome to the New Josh Wan Podcast. My name is Isaac Kamins. This is a bi-weekly podcast where my friend Jess O'Brien and I discuss internal martial arts, qigong, and meditation. Uh, this week, we continue our discussion of Chen Wei Ming's Tai Chi Da Wen. Uh, we look at Chen Wei Ming's discussion of Tai Chi Chuan's martial application. In the Patreon episode, we go into a lot more detail on the martial applications. So if you're interested in martial applications, go check out the uh, Patreon for the extended episode. Uh, then we turn back to the final verse of the Song of 13 Postures from Baiwa's book, uh, which goes into uh, sort of the whole of the Song of 13 Postures. And this week in our... Con- uh, continuing Patreon discussion of internal alchemy. We discuss uh, Wang Mu's book on the foundations of internal alchemy, and we continue our discussion from the 1994 article from Qi Journal with Bruce Francis on Taoist meditation. Uh, this week we talk about the concept of Shen. So check that out. Hope you enjoy the episode. Thanks for listening. Thanks for all your support, and take care of yourselves. Let's return to our discussion of the Yang style Tai Chi as taught by Chen Wei Ming. Um, his book Tai Chi Ta Wen has had some interesting little tidbits and questions and answers that are sort of off the cuff. They're not as formal as the Tai Chi classics and stuff. So it's been fun to see his just he he presents his answers as if they're Master Yang Cheng Fu's thoughts that he preserved. Uh, but you can tell it's Chen Wei Ming himself that's also got plenty of opinions. And he's just, you know, answering class questions from people. And uh, I remember some of these questions I asked myself, like, well, if I don't push hard, then how am I supposed to knock him over? Stuff like that. You know, like the type of things that every student ends up asking along the way, like, why the hell am I doing this? All right. So the next chapter is Tai Chi fighting techniques. San Shou. How do you use Tai Chi's free fighting? So Chen Wei Ming says, Tai Chi boxing has over 70 postures. All of them are applicable for free fighting. But if all the postures are for free fighting, what's the use of learning push hands? Because Tai Chi's free fighting must be nourished by the listening energy of push hands. That's that Ting Jing we've been talking about. Only when you have this energy can you use free fighting correctly. If you can't stick with your opponent, then you don't know listening energy. And your free fighting will only be external boxings blocking and disconnecting. Each movement will then be incorrect. So there you have it. As these... Uh, Once again, Ting Jing sensitivity and fluidity are the keys to using Tai Chi. And that's why you've got to do a lot of push hands before you can really feel like you're going to be able to apply the techniques into free fighting very well. Yeah, that you learn the form, you learn push hands, then you learn the techniques. I mean, that's this is what he's saying, that then you learn fighting techniques. So he lays it out like this. There's a, there's stages. He says, uh, so the first level is to just gain familiarity with touch. Just get used to touching and being touched. The second level is listening energy where you use your awareness penetrates into the other person kind of. He says, familiarity with touch is not formidable, but to listen is much more difficult to learn. For instance, when someone attacks you with a fist, if you are unable to stick, you can't listen to his strength. And if you can't listen to his strength, you can't follow in any direction. And therefore, you can't use free fighting. If you can stick, you can follow. And if your opponent's arm goes up, you can use your other hand to hit his chest. If his arm goes down, you can follow it and use your other hand to strike his face. If his hands come forward and his energy is on his left side, follow it and neutralize it to the left. Then separate your hands, using one to follow and the other to hit him in the head. (laughs) So... (laughs) He's basically, if one guy pushes on one side, you step to the other side and slap him in the side of the head with your uh, your free hand. That's that Tai Chi, like folding it's called, or absorbing with one side of your body and then using the activity of the other side of the body to clobber him. Well, I mean, and I think just the first part of it about, you know, first you got to connect to them, touch them, then you got to listen be sensitive and see which direction they're going know what they're doing and then you can apply any technique you know whatever so well it's almost like they push you into doing the technique right it's not like i have a technique ready to go it's more like if he shoves me down i yield that direction and then my other hand swings the opposite way and hits him from the other side like that clock effect like you push one side it's yeah i think it's like 
it's a percentage. I mean, you use a little bit of your intent to decide how it shapes at the end, but the basic thing is already coming out of you. It's sort of like you know, their force makes the wave come right. out of you, and then oops, then you decide how what the shape the wave. Sure, makes, sure. You know? But the general surge, that's that Tai Chi yielding that gives yeah. you the advantage that you're talking about stealing their power. So he says, in short, Tai Chi free fighting is different from other martial arts because it is based on adherence and listening. Whereas the free fighting of other martial arts lacks these sensibilities. If the fighters are too far away and they're unable to reach each other. But when they're too close, they grab each other and the stronger one wins. So I'm talking about other martial arts. So he says, uh, I asked Professor Yang about this once. Uh, so he goes directly to the source, asks Master Yong Cheng Fu. He says, suppose you gave a free fighting function for each of the Taiji postures. Would it then be perfect? And he answered, in free fighting, there is no one set way. It all depends on circumstances. If you know listening energy, you know a hundred different applications. But if you don't know Ting Jing, even if you know many techniques, you won't be able to use any of them. For this reason, I left the free fighting applications out of my first book. Sun Tzu says that you must know yourself to know others, and that even when starting... After you arrive before the, you arrive after uh, before the opponent does, Taiji Ting Jing has the ability to know the opponent. If one sticks to the opponent and he does not move, I also do not move. If he moves a little, I move first. He will then be thrown out. But if one's Ting Jing is not good, one should not even bother fighting. So I think he lays it out there pretty well. You know, Yang Cheng Fu is trying to tell you like. Once again, you can't just make up a perfect application for each of the postures and just try to do that on someone. Yeah, the the situation requires you to move adeptly, and and the posture sort of has to create itself by what the opponent gives you by and use the ting jing to figure that out. Yeah, the 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 principle comes first, techniques come second, right? There you go. You have to be able to do these basic things in any technique first. And then you apply them to more techniques. It's so right. I mean, that's essentially why you can learn most of the principles of Tai Chi in a short form, right? But you're not going to learn all the fighting applications of Tai Chi in a short form, right? Mm -hmm. Makes sense. But all the things. But the important can, part is getting that sticking and that that right, listening because all the ones you're going to do after, you know, in the long form, are all based on those initial you know the same principles right so some schools are more technique based some schools are more you know principle based you know some schools you almost never do fighting applications and you do tons of push hands right other schools you do very little push hands very little fighting applications and you just do a ton of forms you know like two mm -hmm. forms and things like that you know, other schools, you do a, most of it through fighting applications, and there's a little bit of push hands, you know. And it's that Yang Shaoho approach of small class, few students. <laughs> well, I mean, when Bruce would teach, it was it was always application-based in the sense that the, the you know, you were learning the form. Well, you were learning how to remember the form through the applications. It's like exactly. the application. It sticks in your head better. Yeah, where the. Well, it sticks in your body, I think. Mm, true, true. Okay, that's a better way to put it. So here's a good question that every Tai Chi teacher gets asked. Suppose you meet a fighter from another school, and his hands and feet are so quick you can't stick to him. What are you supposed to do? Now, that's a good one, because that's a question every Tai Chi practitioner must answer once they start sparring. You're like, holy shit, these guys are fast. And stay, you know, it's hard to stick to somebody when they're jabbing and jabbing and jabbing. How are you supposed to stick to that? So here's Chen Wei Ming. He says, other martial arts maintain a certain distance while fighting. But if the distance is too far apart, the opponent would not be able to reach me. If he wants to hit me, the distance between us must close so that the arms and legs can finally reach. When he closes, then you can stick and use listening energy. Then if he is fast, you are fast. If he is slow, you are slow. At this moment, you can't be afraid. Simply stick. There is no danger. Only if you do not have listening energy will he have the advantage. So right. dang so it comes back to sensitivity, right? You got to just wait till he gets in range because if he's outside the range, then you don't need listening energy. Well, and you have to move. I mean, what he's mm. really saying is that that's when you use your footwork, mm. right? That 
if they're if they have really ha- fast hands and feet, the only thing you can do is stay out of range of those hands and feet, withdraw so that they have to come to you, and then when they come to you, they put themselves at a disadvantage, right? But that if you come in, you know, trying to trying to you know, box with someone who's a lot quicker than you, they're just gonna light you or up. Yeah, I'll box right? your ass. You have to you use that to, listening energy. Somehow. You have to use. This is where the idea of 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 what Bruce refers to as distance appreciation comes into it, right? That each technique has a range. And one of the things you learn mostly through sensitivity, and this is the part you don't get through push hands, right? This is the part where um, people who don't spar with Tai Chi get really surprised the first time they spar because they're used to doing things where you start at touch mm. not used to doing things where you don't start at touch right and so they're not keyed into what you do when you know that thing is flying towards you you have to move your feet there mm. is no other way to deal with something coming towards you so this in a sense is why in my opinion shingy makes a better fighter faster than Tai Chi does because what you learn in Shingy is you learn structure and you learn how to move on angles with that whole structure. And as far as like just talking about like scrapping goes, that's much more applicable, you know, on day one than yeah. try to be super sensitive and soft. That like, takes some practice. Yeah. And what you learn in the forms of tai chi in the in the fighting applications of tai chi is that sort of approach similar to shingy where it's just you know they start to move and i hit them like mm-hmm. it i don't wait for you to do something and try to be yin and soft i mm-hmm. see an opening and smack it's and, hair trigger <laughs> effect yeah well it's the yang side of tai chi not the inside of tai chi and if you're going to learn the fighting part you know that has to be a piece of it at some point where it doesn't have to be all the time but it has to be something that you can find inside of yourself definitely so then the student isn't satisfied and says well what if their listening energy of your opponent's the same as yours then how are you supposed to use free fighting he says then it would be difficult to apply because they are both are able to listen and neither will disconnect if one does separate and effectively uses a free hand fighting it, it means his level is higher a good Tai Chi practitioner will stick with the opponent and not allow him to use the free hand. Therefore, the sticking with the hands is very important. Don't disregard it. So this is my interpretation is that is when come, someone closes and is throwing punches, you use something like Pong to sweep and make contact with their hands as they're entering in and using footwork preferably too. In that instant, you have to apply the Ting Jing. The same Ting Jing that you would apply in a big push hands pattern, you've got to apply in one instant as your Pong makes contact with them you have to decide whether to push forward and use G and attack or Liu and roll back. But you have to apply that, that Peng Jing hella quick. The, the short answer is if they're as good at you as listening right. to energy and you, they're as good at you with the techniques, you're probably going to lose. But your, your best chance at winning, essentially, is to let them do what they want to do and to try to find a gap in what they're doing right so i'm not going to be faster than you i'm not going to be stronger than you and i don't have more you know better technique than you but the one thing i might be able to do is find a gap in your awareness right and again this is the thing that shingy works on that's so key in the in the application of fighting is i don't care what your hands do I don't care what your feet does. I care what your mind is doing, right? And so there's that microsecond between when you do one thing and you do another thing, there's a gap. And if I'm able to pick up on that gap, it doesn't matter if you're faster than me. It doesn't matter if you have more technique. It matters because I caught you in that, you know, half a blink of an eye where you weren't aware of it. Now, that's unlikely. It's highly <laughs> unlikely, right? Because essentially what you're working on is the assumption that the other person thinks they're better than you 
And because they think that they're going to put themselves at a disadvantage, right? And so this is, in a sense, you, you rope a dope, right? You play dumb so that they kind of expose themselves and then you can maybe catch them off, you know, on, on an angle. So you play off of their, their confidence essentially. Mm -hmm. But other than that, you're probably going to get smoked at that point. You know, <laughs> it's like, it's just kind of the way things go. I mean, yeah, it's like, look, if they're just as good as you. <laughs> so shall we move to the final verse of our uh, Taiji we'll classics? Yeah. So here at the uh, Song of 13 Postures, as explicated by Bai Hua in his book, Uncovering the Secrets of Internal Power in Taiji. So here we are at the final verse. <laughs> Excuse me. So here we are with the final verse. Here's how it goes. This song has a total of 140 words, which truly teaches the mystery of the 13 postures. None of the words is wrong or superfluous. If the learner does not pursue the formula described in the song, then it will be wasting time and energy in vain, and one will fail to achieve the goal. So that's a nice wrap up. It seems like a lot of these poetic, uh, you know, ditties ends, you know, with a wrap up set, uh, statement at the end that kind of brings you a full circle and says, okay, this is all you need. Work on it carefully and diligently, and then you'll succeed. Otherwise, um, you know, basically exhorting you to work harder, which is a very Chinese martial arts thing to do. So here's what Baiwa says. He only has a single sentence to define this and says, space is infinite. Progress is also infinite. If you want to make progress, you can't be superstitiously concerned with your previous thoughts and cognitions. Which I interpret as don't let your current understanding hold you back as you continue to evolve and test and question everything you know. Because if you stick with your routines, which... He's right, you know, and I feel that on a personal level because, like, I have, a, you know, five or ten of my favorite techniques that I use when I spar or whatever. I kind of rest on my laurels with those. If those don't work, I'm pretty much toast, you know. Like, it, I I, I got to keep pushing and testing and seeing if I can make small adjustments to forever find another level higher, Um, you know. But in my middle age, I'm not as concerned. But, yeah, in my daily practice, I have things I work on. So in a sense, that's progress, but also I do get stuck in my own thinking in terms of what's worked for me in the past, I tend to stick with, right? Like I'm not out there throwing everything out and emptying my cup all the time, like, like maybe I could be. Well, I mean, I, yeah, I, I don't know how literally you have to throw everything out, but, uh, you know, the, the idea that preconceived notions mm. essentially, right i mean so the way i look at it is don't go into your practice with the assumption it's going to go a certain way essentially right then that way you don't go into a martial situation thinking it's going to go a certain way right so you start yeah. training your mind to be comfortable with uh, shit going awry right and so when that happens on a micro level a thousand times in your form and you start noticing each one of those and you start you know analyzing and getting you know getting fewer and fewer of those things when you go to actually apply your technique in real time you you know there's no guarantees but you have fewer restrictions fewer things inside of your mind and your body that are going to get stuck and that's just what we call conditioning right or practice that you know what makes the difference between a good blank and a bad blank it's practice right like i mean there there's no other way to you know whether it's fighting playing an instrument you know whatever it is like surgery you know you, you got to do it a bunch to get good at it and if you do it for a really long time you know at a certain point the rules stop being as important as you can kind of just feel what needs to be done right and this is the and i think like bruce for example i mean was always very very specific about martial applications very vague about push hands patterns mm. so we did one style of push hands 
with essentially one pattern. You know, it was the large frame, single-handed, you know, Pong on G Lu pattern, right? And and we never did any of the like uh, fancier patterns or anything like that because the whole thing was this part's about learning how to touch somebody else, how to be comfortable with somebody else touching you and what to do, you know, when, when they push on you. Right. And then the, 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 if you wanted to learn how to do things with your hands and what to do in, you know, this situation or that situation, that's where you had learned the, the fighting, the, you know, the long form and the fighting application. So it was like very clear that like, for most people, the the principles are, you know, much more of a value to them than knowing a thousand different ways to hit somebody. I mean, that's for sure. You know, it's more. I mean, I think it's more fun when you do it with all the martial applications. Like, yeah, you know, it's it's more oh, yeah. engaging. It's more interesting because it's like, you know, it's like learning a language in a sense. You get all this stuff that you wouldn't get if you were just, you know, just learning the alphabet. Right, you're totally. learning how to conversational oh, yeah, yeah yeah so it's 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 a more complete thing if you do that but the again the 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 principles are all contained in those first few you know techniques or whatever so just for completeness sake let's see uh lewis swaim's translation of this final verse he says this song oh this song has 140 words every word is true and concise there are no omissions if inquiry proceeds without regard to this, one's efforts will be wasted, and this will only cause one to sigh with regret. Ain't that the truth? Well, it's I mean, yeah, it's it's the standard ending to all of these yeah. um instructional poems is you know, uh this is the whole of the thing, and all you need to do is follow this. And if you don't do that, you're wasting energy. Yep. Right? The size, yeah. And okay, here's T.T. Leong's version. The song of the Tai Chi 13 postures contains 140 Chinese words. Each one is genuine and true doctrine, which explains fully and without reservation the meaning and purpose of Tai Chi. If you do not seek carefully in the direction indicated above, your time and effort will be spent in vain, and you will have cause to sigh with regret. Uh, this conclusion stresses again the genuineness of each word of explanation, which present the only correct way to acquire this art physically and mentally. If the student does not study with diligence and examine carefully according to what the song indicates, his time and effort will all be in vain. So, yeah, there you have it. Now, the last one I wanted to look at was Barbara Davis's version in her book, The Taiji Trend Classics, an Annotated Translation, um, 2004. And she's, as usual, goes a little deeper than most others. Um, she says, let's see, here's the final verse. She says, Oh, sing, oh, sing, those 140 Z, Z meaning characters. Each Z is true and accurate with no omissions. If you don't study this carefully, you'll be wasting effort, leaving regretful sighs. So she says the poem has a total of 168 characters, including this last stanza, but uh, it should be taken as a comment on the preceding stanzas, which total 140 characters. It's tempting to substitute words for characters, but the meaning is different. As we have seen, many of the characters are combined to form compound words throughout the song. If you don't study this carefully, um, she says this could actually refer to Taiji Chen in general, but I but she thinks within the context of this stanza, it most likely means this poem. So if you don't study this poem carefully. And then leaving regretful sighs, she comments on that uh, line saying, who is sighing regretfully in this last line? Is it the teacher admonishing a student? Or is it a practitioner regretting not having worked harder? Or both. Oh, it could be both. It's notorious for your teacher to sigh that, uh, oh, these idiots never get anything right. Right. But I mean, I've also had the experience of, you know, someone who's been teaching Tai Chi for 15 years and you show them how to turn their hips for the first time and they go, oh, man, what have I been doing for the last 15 years? You know, it's, so That's it's like a sigh right there. Um, it goes both ways. <clears throat> right. Yeah. Uh, there's plenty. And there's the sighing of the I, I miss Master Yang Cheng Fu. He was better than all of us. And he could he could like totally show us how to do it. And now we don't have him anymore. And 
I didn't work hard enough while I was with my teacher. That's always the sense. I could have done more while he was alive. There's always I that been there. sense of, I mean, you know, these guys weren't always the most chipper. So there seems to be this. <laughs> I mean, if it's written in 1920, it's not the greatest vibe. Let's put it that way. Well, and it's also the idea that, like, you don't know what's going to happen at the end. So right? don't waste your time. You know? Totally. Every day could be your last, you know, that's right. I mean. And every lesson with your teacher could be the last. So yeah. it's probably smart to get as much as you can out of it. I mean, in our experience over the years, we've been training together a long ass time. And I'm thinking like there was, there've been periods, right? Like when we were first getting together and we were super excited about training and, and going to Kumar's classes and hanging out and practicing everything we could, like we were on fire, you know, but then later we went through, the the apprenticeship of becoming teachers and then being teachers and now we're middle-aged and older and like those uh, those moments seemed like the last forever like the weekly class it felt like we just always have weekly class from here on right like right. we'd go get burgers after and drink beer and talk about class like well that's, that's with the crew the, like but now those are precious memories it's gone forever you know right well that's i think that's the argument for in a sense one, don't miss it while it's happening, but also right. don't live in the past, you know, that that because mm. if you're living in the past and thinking about the, the good old days or you know what's what's True. living in the future about what's to come or what you're gonna do, you know, when you finally get good, then you're in both cases, you're missing the Tai Chi, right? Because the Tai Chi is about what's happening right now, right here in front of you and and you know, in your body at this moment. So yep. all that other stuff is is uh you know, distractions, as Bible said. So I think you know, the you know, I, I did Tai Chi for 30 years before I cared about reading any of this stuff you know that right that i think you know the the study doesn't mean sit there and read a book it means get out get off your ass and go right. practice. i mean i think go go practice with these ideas in your head right but but really you know you're not going to get it from just sitting there analyzing what the word you know what the words mean the characters mean right get it by struggling with these concepts you know of what do these words mean in the context of this art that I'm practicing, right? And then that's totally. when they have meaning, and that's when they have. So you know the thing about I was uh, I'm surprised you, I'm glad you said that because I was like, there's more than 140 characters. I'm like, the fuck are they getting this 140 <laughs> from? <laughs> it's like okay, yeah. But anyways, yeah. So it's it, it does you know. I mean, again, I think like that points. Once again, to this idea that this was written later and they're trying to like both like solidify what the teachings are, meaning like this is what the, you know, this is what you need to focus on is another way of saying these are the, you know, these are the rules. And then the, the other side of it being it's way more than we could ever write down, you know, and, and, mm. and you know, this is just a guide to get you going and and now you know go spend the rest of your hopefully long and prosperous life practicing tai chi pretty much it's a never ending adventure yeah and we've come to the end of the 13 songs and yeah. that's the end of our discussion of the tai chi classics for now i think we kick some ass All right bro sounds good Hey folks, thanks for listening. Hope you enjoyed the episode. Just a quick reminder, check out the uh, Instagram for images to go along with the episodes. And we also have a Facebook group. All right, thanks for listening. Take care of yourselves and be well.